All right, so uh, let's see, move this over here. All right, you guys see my screen? Okay, great. So um, let's go through quickly through uh, the the kind of um, you know I think it's always important to know where you know how things evolved and how we got here. Uh, it's really exciting for me to look at you know where things were because I've always been a believer that real time is going to be the future, uh, especially for film. And, uh, you know, since uh, 2003, I think when I saw the light bulb go off, you know, as I was using real time tools for Need for Speed actually at EA. Um, so, you know, I used to say the future uh, uh, of storytelling is real time. And now I have to say the present because it's kind of already happened. Uh, finally, it, it took a little longer than I'd anticipated, um, but, you know, it's very, very cool. So, in 2018, uh, Digital Market Media got acquired by Unity, and then uh, we've been starting to work and integrate uh, as many of the tools we can uh, to collaborate. Um, and then the R&D team uh, built their uh, official Unity virtual camera. So we're looking at um, how all the tools can be streamlined and having a workflow uh, end to end. And that's kind of uh, the things I'm going to be touching on. So my background was in film, uh, Twister, Perfect Storm, and Star Wars were, were the highlights for me on uh, when I was at ILM. And um, you know, I, I got started in visual effects in 1990. Back then, The Abyss was the kind of first film to you, not the first film, but the the first. Uh, use of CG that was very notable, uh, very photoreal and like impactful. You know, we always, we had the Genesis effect in, in Star Trek, uh, you know, there's the stained glass night in Sherlock Holmes. Uh, and then there's the, the last Starfighter CG work. Uh, Tron uh, was happening. Um, but, but the Abyss and, and Jurassic Park, I think, was, and T2 were the kind of landmark three that really got that industry going. So. Uh, you know, I got involved in a film in 1990 uh, that, that, you know, I learned everything on, but we got to uh, apply CG techniques on it. And it's been really interesting to see the evolution of, you know, CG in general, and now uh, having everything kind of moving into real time. Uh, these were some images I had made in uh, 2019 Unity HDRP. Um, and you can see uh, even though this is two years ago, still the images hold up really well. You have a lot of cinematic quality to things. You know, we're using depth of field as volumetric lighting and atmospherics. Uh, you know, really, really uh, incredible tools. These are a million polygon models, these characters. Uh, they're, they're, they're not meant for real time, but they run in real time on a laptop. You know, uh, so really, really interesting. Then we had the exposure tools that we used on uh, the Greyhound film as well as Blade Runner 2049 for visualization. And that involved, you know, having different camera rigs, being able to take uh, snapshots and do takes and basically edit entire scenes together, you know, uh, do some lighting work. Uh, and these tools were uh, built to be uh, hands off. So you basically run, you know, hit play in the editor or run a standalone and you could just do everything you needed to do. Uh, so yeah, I think 2005 uh, was at some conference, I was like, you know, we were convinced that the future would be real time. Uh, so a little bit of um, background on the film side. This is a scene from uh, Star Wars episode one, the pod race crashing. This is the Mars pod. It was the first one that we did uh, for that film. And the significance was we basically this did the destruction as one take, kind of like if you actually blew up a miniature, and then we could put the cameras where we wanted and film it. And this was kind of the beginning for me of what I call a master scene, which is basically uh, something that I'm promoting as the best way to work for visualization is you, you create all the animation that happens in a scene, and then you can go and start uh, filming it, you know, and it's true that uh, every shot pro probably would be tweaked. Um, but 
at the same time, uh, you want to have your your overall storytelling and overall basis at least worked out. You know, even if you're going to go in for every camera angle, nudge things. So I think that, you know the master scene concept really really worked in uh, Greyhound, where we we were able to uh, build entire scenes and then film them uh, using all the virtual tools. And I think that, um, you know, I'll be showing some pieces of that. Uh, so this is the footage I dug up that uh, I haven't seen in decades, but it, it survived uh, a transfer that I did last month. Uh, but it's really cool because it's kind of the early days of previs. You know, it, we didn't really have anything called that at the time. But for Perfect Storm, we started having these ocean simulations and we could bring them into uh, Maya in real time using a plugin. Uh, and then I built the ship simulation using Maya rigid bodies and scripts that would sense where the ocean was. And it would all run in real time on an O2, SGI O2. Uh, and so we would get things like this where, uh, yeah, see, I wasn't kidding about <laughs> pneumatic tapes. Uh, but this is uh, back in 2000. I do somewhere I have a crisper version of this, but you know, hopefully you can see the see the footage. So the, the the way we would do the shots is basically we had the ocean simulations, drop the ship into it, and then put the camera on another ship. Uh, so you know, you have, you really got that sense of being out on the ocean. These ran in real time, so the 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 director could you know could tell tell us what he wanted to nudge and then we'd just do it and that shot before there that you saw with the little targeting sign um this one uh, a lot of the shots were using this virtual camera which is basically a maya rigid body with scripts that would tell it to try and look at a particular target but it was programmed to feel human so basically if something moved really quickly it wouldn't react immediately it's not like an aim constraint it would it would have a, a lag and then but it was smart so it would catch up so that's kind of like we had a we had a basically a drunk factor and a smart factor drunk factor meaning how much how much delay between the time it moves and you catch up so the more you know humans are drunk and smart so those two factors something moves really quickly they're not going to catch up uh, as quickly as a computer would but then they're smart, they catch up to it, they accelerate. So that's what this uh, script was doing. And a lot of the shots, maybe 50% of the shots, were actually using that simulation for the virtual camera. Uh, it worked great from ocean to ocean, but unfortunately, because of uh, worry about seasickness, they, they made most of it from a helicopter kind of point of view, kind of like what you're seeing here. So yeah, 60 foot wave, really, really hard, <laughs> kind of insane. By the way, these wave simulations were running on SGI towers that had 32 processors and they would run for a week. Uh, you know, uh, John Anderson at the time would basically run simulations that would um, uh, push wind. This was me debugging my ship code to kind of catch up with these waves. Uh, some, some debugging necessary. Yeah, it was bad. But uh, it's a ship made out of plywood. Yeah, and this is a test shot, uh, a video version of it. But you know, it was it was pretty cool. We we had um, I think eight eight weeks to do this one. It's entirely CG, and we had uh, you know uh, really really cool uh, to be able to do that. So yeah, that that was like because it was real time, and we could put the camera somewhere, and it would just happen. You know, I felt uh, you know we were we didn't call it previs at the time, but you know, I think it was a really good start of that era. You know. And you know it was really interesting for the director to see. So when I joined EA in 2003, uh, I, I saw I wanted to do real-time camera work, and so we built this tool called Ice In-Game Camera Editor, and it was used for all the Need for Speed cutscenes as well as uh, James Bond and Skate later. Uh, and the Skate one would let the audience actually edit what they've done, but. This is kind of the beginnings, the very beginnings of all the, uh, you know, the virtual tools um, that we built uh, for DMM. It's basically all controller based. So here's the timeline at the bottom. You can scrub, you know, uh, scrub your, your time. 
what I did there was I performed a drive with the car, hit a button, and then I'm editing a scene to it. So you can make a car commercial in 10 minutes, and that's the demos I would do back in the day. This is 2005, I think. And then uh, you, red meant you're in world space, and blue meant you're in car space, uh, or the other way around. I forget. Uh, but you know, I'm just keyframing start and end points here. You can see the time and the frame number. And then these edit lists would basically go uh, right into the game, you know, um, and, and and that's what would be used um, anytime. Let's say you got busted uh, in the game, it would use um, it would be using these camera cuts uh, that were authored this way. Now, in, in, in case of Need for Speed, they weren't actually applied to, um, uh, they weren't opened up to the audience, sadly, as I wish it would have been, but you know that, that would have been a pretty cool thing to do. So this is really early days of kind of real-time filming. Now, uh, when, uh, when I joined Microsoft in 2010, we built these tools, this was the beginning of uh, you know, real-time game engines used in film. Uh, I believe we were one of the first to do that. Uh, and and uh, Alex McDowell got to use the tools for uh, the Disney film called Order of Seven in 2012. But Jungle Book was the the, the big um, the big one where um, you know John Favreau was using a modified version of Unity that we had all the plugins added to and modified the rendering so that we could basically transmit uh, from Motion Builder from the set. Uh, seven actors, and then you could, sorry, 14 actors would become seven wolves. And the, every every wolf had two actors, one for the front legs and head and one for the back legs. And um, the front person would also be the voice, but they would basically do real time uh, filming of, of these, you know, animals with real time lighting and real time cinematography, film it at the same time. So this way they were able to quickly put the film together. Now, the final film was keyframed, of course, uh, being, being a full on Disney movie, but the visualizations were done using these real time. And if John Farrow wanted to try a different version of the scene that he could just tell, tell the actress to do a different performance. Um, so yeah, we talked about uh, Ready Player One was the second film after Jungle Book to use the uh, same tools. Both of those were done through digital domain. And uh, the Jungle Book was done two blocks from where I live right now at, at DD in LA. And then uh, Ready Player One was uh, DD deploying on a stage in, uh, in the UK, in the one of the stages there. Uh, I think it's just stage H or something. Um, so yeah, it was right next to where there's a Harry Potter museum up there. Just um, for those of you who don't know, DD um, Habib refers to uh, stands for Digital Domain. It's a, a visual effects company uh, in Venice, California, and in Canada and all over the world. And uh, probably the most famous project that they initially worked on was uh, Titanic, uh, James Cameron, like uh, 20 some odd years ago. That's right. Um, yeah, Digital Domain's done a lot of innovative work, including the uh, Transformers films. Uh, you know, they've been one of the, one of the VFX houses. Uh, so um, let's see. Time. So I'm going to show some, a bit of the um, highlight reel. So these are, these are the uh, exposure tools before the new Unity uh, virtual camera tools were done. And, um, you know, they, they show some, some interesting um, steps in doing these. So first of all, we have a device that you can hold, uh, you know, preferably that had a depth sensor in this case. And then, uh, you know, when you move that device, it would basically track itself and feed that to uh, Unity on a desktop. And then you would see the results on a big TV or in VR. And, you know, we would support camera wheels for actual DPs to, to use what they're familiar with. Uh, but the key thing being um, whatever input you wanted to use, you know, it's pretty uh, straightforward to hook them up inside of Unity. 
And then uh, I developed this controller system, you know, just the evolution of what we were doing on Need for Speed. Uh, the, the combinations of uh, buttons you have on a controller uh, with all these analog controls, <clears throat> you can do a lot of um, finessing with like moving things like it's a dolly or, uh, you know, zooming and focusing all of these things you're using these analog controls uh, while you're also moving your arms as though you're moving a real camera. So the combination is kind of powerful because you move the camera to frame it, but then you can like hit, hit a button to zoom um, using the triggers or you can scrub time with one of the wheels. Here I'm controlling a light with another phone and Dave Stump is filming uh, on another device. And then there's a third person that's controlling uh, the spaceship. Uh, so you, you can kind of, you know, take the tracking devices and connect them to different things. Uh, including lighting, which is kind of fun. Uh, this was Seagraph 2019, uh, where we did live demo. And, you know, you could also have the mocap be live even with like uh, the inertia suits. So if, if you have an X sense or a neuron, here's me in a neuron and I'm doing uh, the mocap, but I'm, I can see myself in real time in the scene. And the reason for that was so I could uh, align myself with everything, you know, that I'm touching. So uh, the mocap for this scene was done in 15 minutes and the scene was put together in about five days. The, the whole point of uh, being able to do these things quickly is, is you know, you want to be nimble with the tools. Uh, you want to be able to uh, drop things in from uh, the asset store or uh, Turbo Squid or, you know, whatever. Um, place you, you like grabbing assets or the one you maybe you modeled something yourself uh, and then those things become what you use in your scene <clears throat> and you can see uh, you know sometimes controlling a, a vehicle sometimes controlling the camera and then what I'll show you today also is a little bit of uh, uh, puppeteering so um, um, yeah, so this is um, the 2019 version of HDRP here, which stands for High Definition Render Pipeline. Um, skip forward. I think there's, uh, yeah, so here's um, 2015, Randall Kleiser put messing around with, uh, at the time we connected it to the structure sensor, which was a depth sensor to scan the rooms and stuff. We were using it to track the camera. So you, you can just see the evolution of these things. Um, and then this is what John Farber would look at while they're filming. Uh, you know, a lot of the animals would have been pre mocap or animated. And then um, the key ones would be live. So the wolves, you know, the, the the tigers they, they would all <clears throat> be able to do the performance while they're being directed and then they would have to build um proxies of the set so if there's if the wolves are like this is people walking but they look like animals right uh they would they would be able to walk on surfaces that match uh what the terrain's supposed to look like so ready player one was about vr so it was very cool to be able to um film it with VR sometimes, or also have the actors be in VR to see what's going on. And then, um, you know, the, they, they would be able to modify the set in real time and also use, here's the VR camera tools. These were built, the, the VR camera tools were built by um, Digital Domain uh, with Irish over there. And then, uh, and then what we did on our side was we were able to make the streaming be double-sided between uh, Motion Builder and Unity could go back and forth. Uh, so anyone who wanted to move something virtually, they could just move it in, in either package. You know, this is the real-time stuff here. Uh, so they could just choose to move it uh, in a different place. So let me go to... Um, let me go to... Uh, there's some Blade Runner stuff. Um, 
we can come back to that if we have time. So these are like uh, prototypes of virtual cameras. Uh, the V2 one was the one uh, Denis used on Blade Runner to, to capture uh, a half a dozen scenes for the film. And we got, also had a shoulder rig. Basically, you would take your sensor and attach it to whatever you wanted to track. Then we also supported uh, Magic Leap, HoloLens, you know, different ways to scan environments uh, so that you could do virtual shooting in them. Uh, this was an environment I, I shot on my phone, you know, did the photogrammetry, uh, and then it was ready to do work in. Uh, a real quick note about Greyhound, uh, the, the master scene method uh, using the real-time engines, this is kind of the difference it was making. Uh, you know, traditional Maya, with six artists versus uh, two people using real time. Uh, could do 300 takes in one day and um, keep the editors way busier than they, they could handle. Uh, this is a traditional pipeline. We have a scene per shot, Maya scene per shot. And then the real time one is this. You have a master scene with all the events happening and then you just film your shots. Uh, and that's what really worked. So we had 45 master scenes for the whole film. Uh, this is uh, John Bruno, our virtual DP on Greyhound. And he was able to, uh, you know, do an incredible works uh, shooting, shooting the, the shots for that. Um, just a quick snippet of this one. You know, the, 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 sh the shots were animated so that we could figure out where everybody's going. And then um, we were able to mocap uh, actors, stand-in actors, to uh, basically uh, be in that environment. And they knew where the enemy ships were or where the, where the other ships were. So they knew where to look. And so uh, all the action was able to be filmed virtually like this uh, and then cut together. And you know uh, these binocular shots, you know, he, John Bruno's actually trying to hold the camera steady while the ship's moving. So we got a lot of believable movement out of it. Uh, so I'm going to skip over that. Uh, quickly talk about Stillway and we jump into real time tools. So this is a, an article um, that's out. You can search for before and afters with Ian Fails about Stillway. And the cool thing was the you know, the dream of actually having the director and DP uh, be able to follow uh, and create the shots themselves. So this is a, a quick video. I see stuff in the chat. Should I be looking at that? <laughs> no, it's just stuff that I posted for everyone. Okay, cool. Just links and uh, like asset store links. So this is uh, Joe Pena, the director actually shooting the scenes for this virtual uh you know the, the, the spacewalk and and uh they were able to find the angles this is the dp uh clemens becker and they they scheduled two weeks to to be able to um uh film this space sequence and what happened was um yeah, you basically, they were done in one week. And you can see Joe got really good at using the controls, uh, you know, to scrub time. And, and, and uh, this is Yannicka that we brought in as a virtual DP. She's done a lot of work in, in VR as well. Uh, but, you know, if you saw the previous, you'll see like it's a really one to one match with what the film was because the actual director and DP were filming it. Um, as opposed to handing it to a facility and then they come out with stuff and then the director keeps sending notes or, you know, whether they're happy with it or not. So, so I think, uh, you know, it's a really interesting, um, you know, this kind of the goals of these virtual tools is to be able to put them in the hands of actual creators. Uh, so this is um, just some work with uh, the pipeline for uh, virtual work. You have essentially, uh, when you're doing concept art and feeling 3D characters and environments, you can visualize them using the real-time tools. And then uh, you expand on that as you add animation and you build master scenes and, and shoot those. So, you know, these are, these are kind of 
important ways that real time is changing things. And then you have how LED screens change things, you know, live green screen, all of these different uh, ways that the real time is, is changing uh, uh, visualization. Uh, so I wanted to show you a quick, a few quick LED tests. Uh, you know, these were done during COVID um, and uh, we were able to um, just go, go somewhere in an office and, and do some testing. Uh, in this case, I'm flying a virtual camera manually for the background. Uh, and then this is shot on an RA Mini. And then we would basically, we could control all the things that, uh, you know, if we wanted to do uh, lighting or um, any changes to um, the setup, it's all real time. So the background's real time rendered. Uh, you can change it on the fly. And uh, let me just go forward in a bunch of other scenes. So these are using some uh, some test scenes. I have ones here where you know we just have people in the background. The important thing here is we were able to you know pull off a hand holding the camera, which is usually not something you can do on LED screens with the lag. Uh, but you know, it's a matter of tuning how how things work. The background is very simple here. These are not you know meant to be photo real characters back there. But I just had a, a previous scene I could pull up and use. And then this this size of that screen, by the way, is a nine by six feet. Uh, and then here's a here's a test uh, in uh, 2020 at PRG, which is a LED stage here in uh, in LA, and. Uh, this is just running off my laptop. I have the whole scene loaded and, uh, you know, very, very basic camera tracking. So, you know, there's a lot of um, uh, virtual production camera tracking tools uh, that you can use. And uh, the, the important thing is to uh, build your scenes in a way that you can uh, modify them quickly, be able to do lighting, uh lighting changes and 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 then uh as you go forward you can see like here's the size of that set so this is like uh, two 25 foot walls and a floor and uh the astronaut's legs were on the ground the whole time it's hard to tell uh, but this technology is really um changing the landscape of things for sure so um want to go into, I guess I can go into the real time and come back to the virtual camera here. So, so this is the, this is a little, um, a little setup scene I have here where we have, I guess if I open this, I can put that away. Uh, this is what I call my little puppeteering rig. So, Essentially, I can, uh, you know, build these characters that I can control and um, and record their their movement. But before we, before we get into that, uh, let me quickly go over the uh, basics of Unity in terms of an interface. Uh, so how many here use Unity or have tried it? I have tried two, uh, two the, the ball rolling exercise and the 2D exercise with the Unity. Oh yeah, the the classic ball. Yeah, that's a good one. Oh yeah, so so it's a free download, um, and um, when you in, when you create a project, I would choose HDRP to get the high definition render pipeline uh, visuals, and then uh, it, it the, you know it's very easy to get up and running with it because um, it's basically um just like maya so if you're familiar with with the maya interface uh you'll feel at home and then um on the left side is the hierarchy which is like the outliner you have the 3d scene view right here and the camera controls are the same same as maya and um you have the inspector on the right. So if you, if I pick something, for example, 
I don't know. Let's say the tech recorder. So it it'll show it it'll show you uh, or if I pick a light, let's say actually. Um, what I'll do is, yeah, this is going to be good. So this is the post process. Uh, we call it the volumes. And the reason they're done as volumes is you can have different ones for like if you have an interior or exterior or different parts of your your world, you can modify your the look of your atmosphere and lighting and things like that. Uh, so if I turn the post process off, you can see, you know. Uh, a very basic look with, with basic lighting. Uh, this floor is here for her to walk on. You'll see when I get her to walk. Uh, but, but, but when I turn on the, the post-process volume, all the, all the goodies come to life with, uh, uh, you know, with the animated, uh, um, with the volumetric lighting and the shadows through that. Um, you can see these, I have two different spotlights here. Uh, that are lighting the background, and if I if I move those around, you'll see um, you'll see the shadows from those on the trees. There's a volumetric, you know. So there's a lot of uh, fun stuff you can play with lighting wise, uh, lighting and look wise, and then um, the the important part is that uh, the blue items here are prefabs. And to make a prefab, well, it's kind of like a Maya uh, reference. So you, you create something, let's say I have the terrain here. If I just drag this down into the project, it'll automatically make a prefab out of it. Uh, it'll turn it blue and then I can drag that into any other scene and get that same prefab to show up with all the same settings. Then you can have variant prefabs, which are like the ones you modified. So I'm gonna go into play mode now. So I'm gonna go live. And I'm going to turn on my uh, Xbox controller to control the character. And you can see now, I, you know, this is a very, very basic uh, animation cycle. Got the little tiger in this scene. Uh, but, but I can uh, walk her around, you know, and, and I can also have her, have her uh, look, look around, you know. So there's a lot of cool performances you can get out of, uh, out of just puppeteering. And then I can record all that and play it back. And I can do this with several characters. So I can basically really quickly build a scene where uh, you know, I'm walking my characters around for previs purposes. Uh, so you don't necessarily have to be in a full mocap uh, situation. And then you can layer your characters and keep adding animation on top of animation. And also, um, she does react to the terrain. She also jumps, but uh, this version, uh, when I, I think I have to tweak something, because when I made her jump, she didn't come back to Earth. <laughs> but you can see she's walking around, basic basic collision capsule there. Um, so that's a, that's like a pretty pretty cool way to animate your characters for for uh, previous purposes. So I'm gonna open uh, the scene with animation in it and then I'm going to show you uh, the virtual camera tool so we can go back. So here's a scene. Um, I think I messed messed with the lighting at some point. Uh, I think I added an area light. Yeah, so you can do really cool things with area lights um, and, and get get the kind of uh, soft feel um, that, that you would get. Uh, I think for this scene, I, I did a modified lighting that's a lot brighter than intended, but you know you can easily toggle things on off to see what they're doing. And I think is this one the main light source. I have a, I have a bunch. Oh, here we go. There's the direction of sun. So you know the cool thing is the values for lights in HDRP are like real world. So you have degrees Kelvin for the temperature. And then the intensity in lux, uh, and you can modify. I think if it's a spotlight, you have, uh, yeah, you can do it in lumens, candela, lux, or EV200. Uh, so for the directional light, I'm gonna like, turn this one down a bit. Um, there's a fill as well. 
pretty bright fill. Yeah, there we go. I like it more moody. <laughs> so uh, you can see, for example, the lights and these different objects. This one is a reflection probe. Uh, these are called gizmos, and there's a little menu here that shows all the different kinds of gizmos you can show. Uh, but what you can do is simply click on it to turn those off. And then, then you have a scene that looks more closer to the finished render. And then you have the actual view from the camera. And this is basically what gets uh, comes to life when you're in play mode. And the, the difference with play mode and, uh, and uh, regular mode is basically uh, regular mode is when you assemble your scene and make all the changes. And then in play mode, that's like, running the actual engine so that a lot of things become active like uh, collision and uh, you know we get you know the, the proper uh, uh, light probe lighting and all those different things kick in we got a pretty good approximation of it in the scene view here but you you can see um, uh, use... so i think uh, my iphone updated itself the ipad still is <laughs> still going so I'm going to just connect this and show you guys really quickly, and then I'll go back to the video to show you um, the proper uh, the iPad one. Let me see. Okay, so the the way to do the virtual production uh, is you want to download um, from the App Store. I think you posted the link, Zach. Yep, already. I did. Uh, so yeah, you want to go to the App Store and get this app on your iPhone or iPad. And then uh, as a bonus, if you have um, an iPhone 12 Pro or an iPad Pro, a new one with the depth sensor, you get better tracking. It doesn't mean you have to have that, but it also has a depth sensor, so it's more reliable tracking. You got less jumping around sometimes, you know, how those things happen. So uh, here you can see in my package uh, in the project, I have the live capture tools which by the way, also uh, um, include uh, the facial, there's also a facial mocap app as part of the live capture. So you can download that as well. And then what you do is you create uh, in your scene, uh, you create a take recorder node. And underneath that, you have a virtual camera device. And this is kind of like what controls your, uh, film back so this is for example the super 35 you have all these different options for you know full frame uh, 65 millimeter alexa 70 millimeter or you can type in a custom one for your sensor size uh here's the iso and then uh you know all the different parameters that get used in the virtual camera so here's the aspect ratio that you can set as well uh now then you what you do is you create a virtual camera actor this is all in the documentation that you get uh, and virtual camera actor is basically the camera that's going to be moved and the device is kind of the overlord. So this is the controller for that camera. Uh, so you'll see switches like, for example, if you're controlling position, rotation, focal length, focal distance, you can turn these on and off depending on uh, if you're doing a first take or an iteration. And then here's the lens package. So I, I made an anamorphic one so that my focus is uh, anamorphic and then, but there's a lot of default lenses you can grab or you can make your own lens kit. Uh, so with that, what you do is uh, you, you, you go into, you open a connections window. So under window uh, live capture, see the connections there. So you pop that open and I usually dock it over here. And this is the basic server that's gonna, you know, transmit the data from my iPhone here. So I'm going to hit start. Uh, so there's two ways you can do it. You can hit start here and actually do your work without being in play mode. Um, or you can be in play mode, which gives you better rendering and you know a bunch of other bells and whistles. Uh, but you want to make sure um, that it's not started if you're going into play mode, because that'll automatically start it. Uh, so I'm going to hit start and go into the inspector here in the game view and on my um, on my device here i'm going to connect which should be there we go 
So now, you, can you guys see my video as well as the screen? Yep. Yeah. So even though there's you know lag with Zoom, uh, you can you can see the response of this thing. <laughs> it's it's really really good, right? And, and you can tell I I had a lot of copy today because it's shaking a lot. Um, but there's uh, tools for fixing that. So on the phone, I'm gonna do. I was gonna log in. Uh, zoom on the device, but um, it's easier if I show you the video for that. You fix that with the, the decaf button, right? Yeah. The decaf feature. It's so, a package. Yeah, exactly. There's a decaf. So uh, I'm going to go to, um, where are we? So I have all my displays here. And then uh, if I go to, uh, here, so uh, there's a there's a, a, a damping mode enabled. So I enable the damping mode. You can also set how much. Right now it's 0.05. I think it's in seconds. Uh, so you can see the shaking is uh, gone. Right, it's a lot smoother. And um, and then on the phone I have little uh, joysticks, uh, so I can move around with the joystick. Or I can change my height. And then uh, I, I have lens controls. So uh, if I go to uh, zooming, changing my lens, uh, changing my focal distance, you can see the anamorphic focus there, right? Right. Kind of vertical. Uh, there's infinity focus, uh, changing my f-stop. You know, if I wanted to have have more, uh, you know, basically the exposure. Uh, that's quarter. That's an F4 right there. And then, uh, the, you know, there's different things like different kinds of focus modes. So let me go through. Um, and, and basically, you, you can move around and scout and find a, a cool framing and then you hit record. And you want to set your the scene name here. I'm going to call it demo. So it's scene number one, shot is demo and take number one, right? And so on the on the phone, or um, I could hit record here in the editor, depending on your preference. Uh, well, actually, no, don't hit record here because <laughs> that's gonna do an iteration of that take. We, we'll get to that later. Also notice I'm in live mode, not in preview mode, but this is the actual record button for takes. But also I'm gonna just use the one on the on the phone. So it's counting down three, two, one, and then now it's recording. And I'm gonna stop playback. So one thing I forgot to do is uh, you wanna take your master timeline. This is the timeline that contains all the animation that you wanna see. Uh, there we go. And I'm gonna lock that. So this, by locking that as a, as a, in the view, that becomes, this becomes the main animation. So let me do another take. Uh, and also while I'm in this mode, I can also uh, scrub time. So if I go here, I can actually scrub uh, the, the take I just did. Um, I just try it again, hopefully we got the animation. Nope. And it's probably connected differently. Uh, yeah. So she's looking around and then the tiger comes into frame. And jumps on it. <laughs> she runs away. <laughs> so this is the, the basics of, of you know scouting and doing takes. I'm gonna get into the details of the tool itself. And then uh, let me stop the server here. And then once you're done all your takes, there's several options of how you can do the editing. Uh, and so uh, there's there's a new thing called sequences that I'm, I won't get into because it would be we need a whole session for that. Uh, it's very thorough. Uh, this is the timeline, and so for each object here, you got the little clips. 
and as I as I was doing these takes, for example, you see the demo take here. You can see the take file uh, that's actually on disk, and, and there's several different ways to do the editing. Um, uh, there's uh, you can actually create recorder tracks, and 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 each one would be a different take. The one I'm using recently is basically uh, where I bring the camera uh, takes directly into um, uh, and node that controls the camera actor here, which is probably why I, I I guess I should have muted this when I was doing the recording. So if I hit play now, um, uh, once I'm in preview mode, actually, so not live, but preview, uh, then you know you get to see when I hit play, not only do we see the animation of the puppeteered character here, and I'll show you how the tiger was animated, but you can get to see all my camera cuts as well. So really, very simply, uh, we were able to shoot the do coverage of the shots you know and then choose when to cut from one to another and all of these are modifiable i can easily change where those cut lines are and i can also reorder when the ticks you know where when the camera ticks happen uh and then so each one of these has uh you know some of them have iteration takes uh which is when I, we do a take and then we iterate on top of it uh by choosing um, let's say you wanted to uh, change the zoom, you know, do a zoom maybe. So first you shoot your shot and then you record a zoom later after you've done your move. And then another really good example is focus. So you do a shot and then you record the focus on it, you know, by focusing uh, separately. Because it's really hard to do all of those things at the same time if you're just one person, right? So um, the the tiger animation is just these uh, these different clips, and you can see they're blended together. So, so the tiger can go, you know, is transitioning from a, a walk to a sneak, and then here's the attack, and then back to a walk. So, there's um, you know, same thing for her. Her animation is coming in uh, somewhere in here. She's down here somewhere. There it is, Cyber Girl. So she's being animated uh, from puppeteering. So these were puppeteering records that I just brought back in. So the whole point is that these things are um, really quick and easy to put together uh, for you to start building your, your, your scenes. But it also not hard to take it to final, uh, if, if, especially if you're doing an animated feature or something. With uh, quality of HDRP, uh, you can, you know, especially you, let's say you've done your shot coverage, then you, it's really easy to tweak your lighting uh, and and have it have it look uh, really fantastic uh, after you've already done your camera work. Um, so easy to get into this, uh, get into the scene, bring assets in, you know in this case, a forest and a bunch of props and things like that. Uh, and I brought in the tiger character. Uh, do your lighting, at least like a, a rough uh, setup of it. Uh, animate your characters and then shoot it. And you, this is, you know, uh, this whole scene was done in an hour uh, to to puppeteer the, the, the girl and, and uh, clip the tiger together and then film the shots and edit the camera work together. Uh, and, and it's, you know, it's easy enough to jump in and then do some other alternative takes or move these things around uh, to see what you like to like to do. Uh, so I'm going to go to the uh, UI video, which is here. So there we go. So I'm going to jump to here. Uh, we just went over that. So here's the controls for the, this is basically the iPad screen. And 
that's what you see on an iPad and on an iPhone, it's a simplified version of it, but the controls are there. Uh, but you have like, uh, whether you want to display the HUD, the gate mask, the frame lines, the center marker, those are all uh, toggleable. You can see the frame lines here. And then uh, the ergonomic tilt is important because you don't want to have to hold the uh, tablet or phone completely vertical. Uh, so what you do is you you hold it at a comfortable angle and then hit that button and then that becomes basically resets your horizon. So you could be holding your iPad at like, a, you know, let's say that, you know, 30 degrees down and then say this is my horizontal, you know, and it'll just reset the horizontal. If that makes sense. And then um, let's see. So we talked about the, this is the joystick on the left to move around. And then this on the right is for your elevation. And then we start doing uh, different things with, you will see what these controls are when to touch with. And this one is the focus mode on the bottom. So the motion axis scale, this is very basically, um, as you move the device, uh, which, you know, how do you want the motion to scale? So if you want to move a little bit and move a lot in the virtual space, you make that a bigger number. So then uh, as you move, you just get, you know, get more motion. Uh, this one, I'm just dialing the, the lens, the lens button uh, to control if you have a zoom lens. And then I'm doing a take here, uh, recording a take. Uh, See if I can get to the focus modes quickly. Let's see. I think these are, yeah, we're just doing the shots. So you, you can see the process of creating these shots um, over here. And if I go back to uh, one other place here. Let me just find that um, going over the details because I want you to see the those. Uh, there's also um, a lot of people doing some great work uh, using the tools. Uh, there's a uh, a great uh, animator, his name is Nathan Thomas. I don't know if you guys have heard of him. But he, uh, he, he built a very uh, fun animated piece using HDRP and the virtual camera tools. Uh, let me see if I can pull that up. And I, Zach, I can send you a link to that afterwards as well. Okay, sure. I can look for it if, uh, is it Nathan Thomas virtual wall? No, it's this one here. Let me put the sound off. Yeah, it's very fun. Okay, here we go. Yeah, the quality is gonna be better when. Talented guy. That's pretty fun. <laughs> oh my god! So um, we, I wanted to leave time for Q and A. Uh, maybe I should have left more time, but how's the now for a point there? These yeah. tools are really fun to play with, by the way. So you know, uh, download and and have at it. You know, you can start. Uh, doing, you know, really, really fun stuff right away. You don't have to, you know, it's all free. And uh, you can become, uh, you know, get, get your digital feature done. <laughs> if for anyone interested, I posted all the links, all the links uh, in the chat. Uh, in the so, chat if you, so if you want to go take a look. 
Yeah, right. so, it, you know, it's really, really um, exciting time with, uh, you know, it's actually a really awesome uh, LED project that uh, uh, just got finished. And I would love to show you what it's releasing on the 16th. <laughs> so I'll send that to Zach to send to you guys uh, as soon as it's out. Uh, but that was, uh, it's basically a music video and it was a, a amazing one day shoot where there was, you know, multiple environments, multiple lighting setups, uh, you know, all, all being done in real time. Cool. cool. That was pretty that was interesting. interesting. Thanks. Thanks, uh, uh, thanks a lot. Thanks of you. A lot of Thank you uh, does anybody have any anybody questions? Have questions? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, Else, else. Oh, actually, oh, actually before, before we, we move forward, move forward if, if you're not, you're speaking, not speaking, do you mind, do you mind muting, muting your mics? Your mics? Okay. Uh, all right. All right. So, um, wow. 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 I think it's happy. Is, happy. Happy. <laughs> oh, Abib, is that, you? that you? Is there some noise coming? Maybe. Maybe. Are, you, are you echoing? Uh, echoing. Yeah, there's some yeah, echoing. echoing. Oh, sorry. I'll put a headset on. I think it might be hello there it goes so um you said that you're uh in do you develop the are you part of the people who like develop the code to have it so that the virtual camera works with the unity also or is it like uh you're more like the person who reviews the the product once it's it's been developed and kind of showcasing it so that other uh, like showing how people are used yeah it's a great question so um, all the stuff I showed you with um, Jungle Book, Ready Player One, uh, I didn't show any Blade Runner, but uh, the, the, the Greyhound, Stowaway, those were done with uh, the exposure tools that I designed. So all the features there were, were things that uh, you know, I came up with together with the team of uh, seven engineers that built it. Uh, but I didn't do like the hardcore coding uh, and also those tools used uh, kind of a node base to create rigs and things like that. Um, but the new virtual camera tools are from the Unity R&D core team. So those are, uh, you know, the, the, the guys that work on the actual engine uh, deep, deep in the, in the, uh, uh, the process of, of, you know, in, internal Unity. So those, the, the, the virtual camera tool that's on the app store uh, was something that was done by the R and D team, you know, and they they referenced some of the work uh, that was done on the on the uh, on the older projects, but it's 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 totally new and it's inter integrated into Unity. So that was that was mostly, um, uh, you know, we we would all uh, test it and give some feedback, but yeah, that was primarily the Unity team. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the the guy who led the team is Brad Weirs. And uh, they've, they've done a really great job. And, uh, you know, we continue to uh, uh, want, you know, work on uh, giving them good feedback and adding features, you know, helping them add, uh, with whatever features get added. You know. Thank you very much. Awesome. Yeah, I can do like mail scripting though. <laughs> and also uh, I do get into C sharp scripting with Unity, which is uh, similar and, that's one of the cool things about working with Unity is you don't have to be a C++ programmer. Uh, you can just do basic c -sharp scripting uh, to connect things in your scene and, you know, be up and running. But that means you do have to, like, uh, go into c -sharp programming once in a while if something's not working with the scene, just kind of to tweak them a little bit. Like earlier, you were mentioning something about tweaking. Yeah, so you don't, not everything has to be c -sharp, but it's powerful if you, wanted to use it um, but a lot of things a lot of the tools you can see like uh, just keyframing and recording stuff and dragging it into timeline for animation is very similar to if you were on a 3d package you know yeah i think what uh, habib is saying is that it it's it's virtually like a 3d package you don't need to know you know the coding aspect of it to use the tools but if you say want to create your own maybe custom sliders or uh, some values then you would have to go into your code and write some you know uh, the editor and write some some c-sharp 
yeah it's a convenience things like because remember it's a game engine so you have access to the full power of everything on the asset store for unity so if you say i need crowds i need grass i need uh, trees blowing in the wind and you know whatever craziness you know i need the waterfall you just type it and there it is and you know five bucks ten bucks twenty bucks you know you you're up and running and then uh you, you know it's it, then it's easy to customize or modify because a lot of it would be done through c-shop scripting and then um you, you know if you have really special th custom things where you say i want whenever i move this light i want this object to move like constraints there's there's tools for constraints, but some people just prefer to just script that. It's just easier for them to say, grab this position and put it over there. You know, I have a script I wrote actually to scroll UV for oceans, you know, uh, to offset the UV based on time. Um, you know, the, the head rotation of the puppet is a script that's taking the joystick position and moving her head. Mm -hmm. So it very simple things like that, you get pretty far. Yeah, I think if you're worried about like the complexity of coding, then um, there's actually a visual scripting tool that's built into Unity um, called Bolt. And it's basically like a layout. It's very similar if you're familiar with Unreal. In Unreal Engine, it's called Blueprints. And it's if you're familiar with VFX and know like say Nuke, uh, it's a node-based system where instead of typing in code, you basically bring in chunks uh, or little nodes and just connect the nodes via like a line it's kind of like a, uh, if you're using a graph editor or like the texture editor or something like that um, or you know it's it, instead of having to type a code you're basically connecting it logically like different nodes together in order to create um, the same effect okay. thank you I see cool. those, uh, those nodes uh, when I was looking at someone programming a game like about a year or so ago. I think that's what you're referring to. So, yeah, awesome. Thank if you. you're if you're interested in learning, Unity has some pretty good um, training sessions, like virtual sessions, like some that I've been a part of. If you look on the Learn Live site, um, we had a series last year and also this year called Create with Code Live. I can post it in the chat. But it's a, basically a very beginner course on getting started with Unity, building uh, very simple games. It, it teaches you basic scripting and C sharp, as well as importing audio into your game and also, you know, animations. And and you can get up and running. We teach you how to build like a like a, a game where it's similar to a space shooter, but instead of doing the traditional asteroid space shooters, we made a game where a farmer is like shooting food and pizza at animals coming down. So it makes it a bit, you know, more relatable and fun. Uh, so you can go check that out, but I'll post it in the, uh, in the chat. Thank you. I have a question. Yep. Um, so happy. Thank you so much for the presentation. It's, it's pretty cool to see that how much that the real time production has progressed. Because I think, you know, I first heard about that term about a couple of years ago. And then, you know, of course, Unity as well as the Unreal has been really developing this technology aim. But from, uh, from me, you know, not, you know, working in the, the film industry, you know, it just sounds like it's going to impact quite a, a big portion of workforce who are in film industry and then I would like to hear your your um, insights on how much um, of the workforce will be impacted by the advance of technology that you are developing and of course you know um, you and your competitor on Rio is developing and you know for you what would be your recommendations for the people who are currently in the film industry and are doing the post-production, what, what, what's your recommendation to them in order to really catch up with this technology? Yes, that's, uh, you know, I see it more as a really happy change, not, not so much as a threat. Exactly, uh, exactly. And, and I've been waiting for it to really take off and happen for a long time. And the, you know, 
as I went from doing visual effects to games, you know, uh, I had I went through that experience of waiting an hour for a frame uh, and being able to do maybe eight decisions a day because I had to wait an hour for each result uh, to be able to tune everything real time for games. And, you know, it, 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 what it meant was that I could get the result I want instantly. Uh, every time I dial something in, that, that shaves off uh, days or weeks of guessing because you're just dialing it. And what it means for um, the film industry is, you know, instead of uh, shooting something on a green screen and then later building the assets and doing the compositing and rendering the background, uh, you're gonna build the same model in, in many ways, it's similar density and uh, detail. Maybe not to a crazy amount that some, I know some in uh, facilities go into, you know, building every brick. Uh, there's, you know, clever ways to build things for real time and it can look identical, you know, like using a normal map um, uh, in, instead of building every brick, you know. Uh, so you, you build your assets, your environments, let's say, and you you work on lighting them and bring them to an LED stage. Uh, and so from the content creation point of view, it's gonna be similar with the difference of real-time lighting though. Uh, but you know, the modeler who builds the environment, it would be pretty similar with, with some addition of uh, real-time streaming, you know, real-time uh, efficiencies. And then, um, the lighting person would be real time on set instead of uh, doing it beforehand. Uh, I mean, they would get it ready, but they would be tuning it real time on set. Uh, and then the compositor here, there wouldn't be any. It's all happening in camera. Now, there's always going to be uh, post processes and post uh, rendering and you know, some of the LED shots don't work, so they have to be replaced, or they're gonna wanna do it green screen because they haven't designed the environment yet. You know, there's a lot of things like that if they wanna keep tweaking something uh, in post and they don't have time to do it before, uh, then you they'd, they'd be, have the freedom of just shooting it on green. And so uh, it puts a lot of uh, visual effects work ahead, you know, uh, but something I used to talk about a lot, which was, you know, you build your assets for your film in a rough form for your previs, and then you you refine the same ones for your LED screen and your, uh, you know, final pixel compositing too. Because a lot of times now it's possible to render your imagery uh, st straight from the game engine. I've been doing a lot of projects. Uh, I wish I could talk about... <laughs> They're all imminently about to be released, <laughs> and I can't say anything about them. But we've been doing Final Pixel EXRs with high dynamic range and alpha channels straight out of the engine, and handing them to a facility to do any final comps, comp work. So, um, you know, and, and you know, at 4K with all the bells and whistles, it's still maybe a quarter of a second a frame. You know. Uh, if it's really taking a while uh, and you turn on ray trace accumulation or whatever. So I think to answer your question, um, I think everybody should be embracing real time and learning a little bit about, hey, here's how I model a little differently maybe, or here's how I light a little differently. A lot of the principles are similar. Uh, if you're a lighter, you know, you, you get to play with the same tools. It's just seeing results in real time. Uh, you know, and, 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 and so you're able to make, make those decisions. Um, and it does change things for compositors. You know, again, it's not like it's all going away. <laughs> for sure, there's gonna be uh, renders that take 70 hours, I'm sure, and, you know, uh, fluid simulations that take weeks. And, and we're gonna have all that post still happening. But I think uh, for, it's a good time for, studios because they're able to add a lot more content uh, or add a lot more locations to their TV series 
uh, because they're able to dial things in and then modify them dynamically. And, you know, with the touch of a button, they go from being in the cave to being in downtown, you know? Uh, that's huge, right? And then, you know, you get to the end of the shoot day and you're like, actually, we, I'd like to do one more cave shot. Bing, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> Now, now you, you know, go find the cave set, you know, and get the saw out and, you know, like we all know, like, yeah, you need some physical stuff in the foreground to play with, but like, you know, especially for TV series, I just can't, unless it's uh, something you can shoot on location, uh, I, it's going to be hard to see, you know, physical sets being used all that, all that much. Uh, maybe some shows take place in like the same office yeah then you can just build it but um you can add so much scope i don't know if you guys seen the work on uh, westworld or yeah mandalorian is a good example but westworld's also good to uh, uh to see um how you, you can just pop in a location and dynamically light it on set you know that's one of the things uh that the, the this music video coming out able to tune things in real time uh, on the LED while the DP is also adjusting things on his camera. You know, it's, it's pretty wild. So for your recommendation, will you say that for the folks who are in post-production, those workforce will be in a way proportionally reduced and then we recommend and just move real time and then learn how Unity works? Uh, well, either well, it depends on there's so much demand for visual effects all the time that I think it's it's more like render times. Uh, the joke is that no matter how fast the machines get, the render takes an hour. And that's because that's people's threshold of how long they're willing to wait. So, you know, mach our machines are hundreds of times faster than what we used to have, but there's still this, the render still take an hour because now we're giving it subscattered hair, you know? Uh, like we just give it more to do. So I think uh, the, the visual effects post the force would, would be there, but you're gonna have a growing other world of the real time happening. And then some of the people from post would move there, but it's just gonna keep adding to what people can do because there's so much demand for content, right? So it's just gonna enable more shows to have more stuff. So before you could say well you know we are a tv series but we can't afford to do even the mandalorian ones uh you know pretty big budget but uh you know like let's say they can't do uh visual quality they need like pacific rim let's say let's say you got a pacific rim tv series right <laughs> that that's pretty hard to pull off with a small budget uh unless you can work with real-time tools. I think that's where more and more we're going to see things becoming more efficient and, and more affordable. And that's still, I know a lot of producers are like, well, it's kind of costing the same or it's close. You know, they're doing the numbers really hardcore between a green screen shoot and an LED shoot. You know, that's always an interesting comparison. Um, but as the real-time starts getting more efficient and as LED prices come down because they're just going to be everywhere, uh, something uh, I was sure would happen a year and a half ago, and now now it's definitely uh, growing and growing. Uh, just like when we saw the transition to uh, uh, ink, you know, inkjet printers from dot matrix, you know, it happens really fast. So, you know, we we're gonna same thing with HD TVs, right? As more people started to have them, the price came down. So I think we're gonna have. Uh, LED screens on every stage, it's just going to be like the green screen. It's going to be a must have. And then uh, more and more people are going to get used to using it. And it's just an alternative. It's not for every shot, because if you have a wide and you want to see people's feet and all that stuff, it's that'd be pretty hard to pull off. But um, you can get a ton of the uh, close ups of people with dialogue and something behind them out of the way to then do your money shots with visual effects or green screen or on an expensive location. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Perfect. I, I, I just see, but I do see eventually, yeah, there's gonna be a, a move 
from the post work to real time. And then it's just going to enable more, co more uh, content that's done more affordably. Crazy. Cool. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. I'm actually adding to that. Uh, Habib, I was just wondering if you, I could get your thoughts on um, what has your feedback been in terms of like your experience on talking to say studios or maybe VFX companies or other people in VFX who have like this set workflow, right? And then now you go in and say, hey, instead of doing 100% in comp, you can do 80%. So that means you're going to have to cut 20% of your comp, but then shift over that 20% to the front end of the production. How much does it take to convince these, you know, whoever it is, producers, studio execs, um, supervisors to kind of buy in on that? And what's their rate of acceptance like right now? Is it like, like you were saying, like, well, the numbers are kind of close. So I think we're going to keep going the way we're going because this is just how it works. And this is how I know, you know, I can deliver on time. Whereas if I adopt something new, I have to learn, I have to train people. Um, what's your take been on that and your experience? And do you think that there's a point where people will, or there's some kind of factor that people realize, oh, it's actually going to really save us time and money, uh, or it's going to really be a benefit in the long run, but it's hard to get people to buy in on the long run, right? All they see is like what's in front and getting things done in, in, in the industry. Yeah. So. Overall, it's been a, uh, a long process for people to accept uh, um, virtual production in the first place, let alone LED screens. And, you know, I think um, just now we're seeing like more and more people use real time for at least the visualization part. And, uh, you know, it's a no brainer that, that a lot of digital content can be done with real time. If you've got a animated feature or animated series. Um, and then, yeah, by the way, that thing I showed you with uh, Matt Thomas, that, he did that in a day <laughs> with, the, with the Pacific Rim, but cute. <laughs> so, um, you know, uh, I think acceptance has been slow in general for virtual production. That's been frustrating for me, constantly telling people the future of film is real time <laughs> for 15 years. But then uh, now, I think because of these landmark projects, people can see, I think there's those that really get it and they're going full bore and they're investing and they're you know, getting set up. And then there's gonna be those that are gonna be left behind. And um, you know, the, even if you, I think it's not just about cost. It's about, um, there's a huge difference when the director and the DP are on a visual effects supervisor are on the set and they tune a light and, and they're looking through the camera and they're looking at the actor and they look in the background like, yeah, that's the lighting, right? As opposed to uh, six weeks of tuning a post shot, you know, with notes. Uh, so if you're really going to compare costs, right, there, there's so much more goes into iterating in post, you know, um, than, than when you can dial something on the spot. Um, so, so I think, I think that aspect of it, you know, whoever has, has experienced it, they'll, they'll get it. They'll be like, okay, this is a complete difference there. Now at the same time, there could be like some really complex visual effects that you can't, you know, it's not a, something that happens on an LED screen. It's going to be like, you know, uh, some wizard is is conjuring some effect that's going to have to be added, right? Um, and then you you just have to do your regular post uh, process with that, uh, and and the effect needs time to develop. It needs iteration. It needs you know, there's no real other way around that one. You know what I mean? It's going to be a bit more time until we can do that kind of post effect on top of the footage in real time. <laughs> it's possible now, but you know, it's gonna be um, a few more things to get optimized and make that happen. That, that, to be able to do that kind of level of work uh, all in one, you know, have all the sandwiching and compositing, because there's still, you can do compositing still on set, um, 
even if you're shooting green screen, uh, you can still have your virtual background being rendered in real time with the camera tracking and doing a green screen comp, a proxy green screen comp, like a rough one. Uh, we call it the weatherman comp, you know, uh, for, the, for the director or DP to at, at least see if they're composing the shot correctly. You know, that's, that's pretty massive there. And the editor is going to have something to cut with that's got the environment in it. You know, even if the green screen edges are, aren't perfect, it's a lot better than a flat green. So I think even in that case, you still want to use virtual production to, to know what you're doing. But yeah, it's been really tough. A lot of productions are like, ah, oh, we don't understand. Is it going to save me money? You know, what does this mean? So there's a lot of different um, things to consider there. But yeah, slowly but surely, I think uh, individuals start seeing it. And then if they start using it, then they get hooked on it. And they're like, OK, I get it. I don't need to be afraid of it. This is a, a, a whole new tool. At the same time, the processes are going to be more and more streamlined on the engine side. You know? Cool. Yeah, that's some uh, good insight, I think. Uh, does anybody else uh, have any questions? No, no questions. We're going to start playing with these tools today. <laughs> I'll play with it. I had a quick question. Yeah, hey, Johnny. Yeah. Hey, so um, why did you choose Unity versus Unreal? Was it just like the languaging aspect of it that you chose it? Because it seems like Unreal is kind of like the go-to package to go to nowadays. So, um, you know, I'm going to be straight up about it. Unreal's got very good marketing. Um, and the reason I, the reason I chose Unity was uh, originally we were pitching this to um, uh, a named director that uh, is not patient, <laughs> and so uh, I had been working at EA and Microsoft. I'd had you know uh, seven at that point years of experience with game engines around the world, uh, working with every division of EA. Uh, you know there was every game had its, had its own engine. <clears throat> And I had also used Unreal on LMNO in LA uh, for two and a half years. And so I knew what it entailed to get assets into an engine. You know, um, I was also involved in, you know, basically when you're on set, there's no, the, you can't delay. If the director says, I need a rock here and I need a tree there and I need a waterfall, it needs to be able to come in instantly. And the only game engine I'd used to that point where I knew you could bring in an FBX with textures and materials and it would just come in as you had it uh, was Unity. It just just worked. You know, drag it in, it's there. Um, with Unreal, you had to make the material, bring in the textures separately, connect the textures. You know, uh, everything was just more work to get to bring in. And then with customization, you need to have C++ developers, a lot of them. So you want, if you're going with, with, with Unreal on a set, set you're going to want, uh, you know, quite a few C++ developers. Uh, with Unity, you might need two people. Now, you know, uh, with HDRP, that's another thing that wasn't around five years ago. Um, and uh, we had developed a custom render when we did the Jungle Book Ready Player One. That was a customized render inside of Unity. And then uh, now with HDRP and all the goodies that they brought on, you know, you get a lot of stuff right out of the box. So it, it, you don't need to do as much customization for renders. And you know, I think that that kind of uh, real-time ray tracing is out. It, it's a pretty powerful setup in Unity where you can choose if you want your reflections ray traced. You want your ambient inclusion ray traced, your shadows ray traced, uh, or all three, you know, um, and then how you combine it. And then there's also a full path tracer. Um, so I think it's, you know, Unity's, Unity was first in doing the virtual production with Jungle Book and Ready Player One. And then, uh, you know, Unreal had a huge push uh, two years ago. Uh, and then uh, now Unity's brought their rendering up to speed. So now with, and also they've been a lot more careful with how the tools have been developed to make sure things work and they're compatible. 
you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, new plugins coming out uh, in the next few months that are going to just uh, help things across the board. So, um, you know, the whole point is for you not to need an army to do your work and to be able to, you know, if it's just a couple of people uh, trying to get their project done, you can do that. Or if you're in a full, uh, huge set with, with LEDs and all that, then that, that can work as well. So, yeah, I think- You foresee like Unity actually coming up and being as mainstream as Unreal, like in the future? Yes, just like it was when they were the first ones to do, you know, be, be used on these, on these productions. Um, and it used to be Unity was um, focusing on the uh, VR and mobile. And that was the purpose of HDRP was to say, we're gonna have, cause that was the, the rule at the time back when uh, in 2010, when we started doing the customized version for, set, for the set, uh, the, the goal is for Unity was that uh, every feature had to be compatible on all devices. What that did was that held you back uh, for whatever a phone can do. And so with HDRP, that was the, the custom version to say, okay, with this, uh, with these packages, it's for high-end desktops and uh, the, as fast a machine as you can get, you know? Uh, so, so then yeah, it didn't have any of those hindrances and then, so then things can push forward. So, it, you know, it's, uh, there's a lot of projects that are coming out that uh, you know they will be showing uh, using virtual production, uh, like I was mentioning, and then um, lots of final pixel work at the same, but all through maintaining an easy workflow. You know, so uh, no matter how big the production is, you know, if someone needs to get an asset in real quick. Um, you know, while it's while it's in run mode, you know, you can you know get things done quickly. So if somebody likes starting out, do you recommend going into Unity or Unreal, or do you think they're both just as good just to start out? And... Um, I'll have to, I guess, I, you know, depends on the, the most recent updates. On uh, Like I know, for example, uh, with Unreal, there's been a lot of demos of um, uh, high-end rendering, but that's with really huge game engine teams. For, for you know customizing it for a PlayStation, let's say, um, when when you have individuals trying to get you know get a piece done, uh, you know what's what's nice with the new tools is that the Unity tools apply both if you're a really big team trying to do a AAA game or if you're a, just a, a single person at home you know trying to do your work. Uh, it 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 applies equally. Um, in terms of strength of what you can do. Um, and the goal is to keep um, people on focusing on the creative and not so much on, you know, getting stuck trying to fix things or make things work or, you know, uh, have to keep developing custom stuff. Uh, and then there's a lot of things available on the stores and, and, and uh, you know, for LED screens, for example, if you wanted to use, you know, middle VR to go on as many screens as you want, or you wanted to use disguise as a system to do the perspective correction for you. Uh, and then a lot of uh, plugins for different camera tracking, all of that stuff, you know, uh, you, you're going to see more and more of that coming. I think it's um, in terms of like my experience when I first started out, like coming from visual effects of course everyone like johnny was saying is talking about unreal it's and a good point that habib made is a lot of it is actually marketing um you know if you focus all your marketing in one like funnel and put it out there or especially if you have say influencers who are very like uh you know in the public eye and they use some particular tool or software to build something interesting and then all of a sudden it becomes like viral then everyone thinks that that software is you know the go-to software to use with but yeah, in mean, fact there's so many different you know options that you can use out there yeah there's been yeah, they, there is good work being done uh for sure with unreal but for example i don't know if you guys know but season two and three of mandalorian is not unreal it's the custom iln engine 
and and I'm sure most people don't know that because of the marketing. <laughs> I actually heard about that. Yeah. Yeah, it's called Stagecraft. I think it's a tool that uh, ILM developed for real time, um, which I had another guest come on talk about. Who <laughs> 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 knows? But I mean, getting back to that, the uh, there's so many different engines out there. Like people really only know about, you know, hear about Unreal and Unity. I think because it's the like off the shelf commercial versions. But companies like um, uh, like EA, they have their own internal um, game engine that is not available to the public called Frostbite. And there's uh, another engine called like Snowdrop. There's one called Godot that people can use. Cry Engine. You know, there's so many. There's probably twenty game engines out there but the only reason why people really talk about unity and real is because it's marketing and also because you know it's in the mainstream but i think the cool thing for me as a user coming into using unity you kind of have to look at it at a point that okay what am i going to use it for and in my case it was like i wanted to do like an ar app and i wanted to deploy it to like an iphone and i wanted to deploy it to like an android device but at the time with unreal you couldn't really do that easily and i didn't want to develop natively and like you know uh uh, in, in iOS or using some uh, like uh, natively within like Apple's ecosystem. So you, the beauty about Unity is you can develop the uh, your application in Unity and then you can port it to whatever you want. Like you can port it to an, as an Xbox game, PlayStation, uh, Android application. You can uh, go to your iPhone, but of course you still have to go through Xcode. I mean, that's the Apple whole ecosystem. There's no way around it, but you know, there's still that flexibility for you to do that. So I think that's one of the cool things about about Unity um, that makes it pretty cool. And what Habib was talking about HDRP now, the high definition render pipeline. There's so many things that you can kind of customize. You can make dogs with fur, you know, uh, yeah. maybe real time rendering, <laughs> real time <laughs> with motion blur. This one has a lot of motion blur, right? <laughs> right. But yeah, I mean, there's so many cool, um, you know, things coming up with uh, HDRP that you can do now. I mean, it's like we got the same tools in in and Unreal, when you look at it, it's like post-processing, you can create your own volumes and then customize like Habib was showing in his demo with the uh, volumetrics, which is uh, yeah, all pretty cool. But uh, does anybody else have any questions? If not, I'm gonna stop the recording and do our little giveaway. Any questions, any questions, no? <laughs> okay. All right, I'm going to stop the recording, but thanks, Habib, for coming on. Uh, everyone, maybe just stick around for a little bit um, while I do this giveaway.